um, you know, various health professionals and students in vestibular rehabilitation. And he was uh, awarded the Robert Williams International Award by the CSP at uh, WCPT Congress in 2011. So over to you, uh, Sami sir. Uh, we would love to hear from you. Hi guys, Th thank you for inviting inviting me over. And um, my presentation is on. So can you can you see my screen, guys? I think my my um, screen has been disabled by host. It says. Um, Nitesh. No, sir. Oh, yeah. I, okay. I, I, sure. Okay. It says screen sharing is failed. Just give me a second, please, guys. Technology. Oh, can you see my screen at all? No, sir, not yet. I think there is some issue with Zoom today again. Okay. Let's try it once more. Okay. So I will just, um, no screen. Okay. Um, I don't know. So right. So if if I quickly um, send you my my presentation to Nitesh, would you be able to share it from there, Nitesh? I can try that, sir. I can try that. Okay. I, I'll take the videos that are embedded in there, and I have already sent it to you, so you, you can then um, add those videos as and when you need to. Okay. Sorry about this. Our apologies to our audience. I think we again technology again failed us. Give us a moment. We'll try to fix it as soon as possible. Okay, I have just sent it to you. I got it, Nitish. I'm just refreshing my mailbox. Any luck on it, Tish? Can you see it, sir? I, I can see it. I can see it. Okay, Just so one, one... Sorry? Just a Sir, let me know when you want me to move on to the other one. So I'll take it from here. I, I will do it. I will do it. Okay. So, so guys, uh, once again, um, sorry about the technical issues, right? So I'm going to talk about introduction of vestibular rehabilitation. Basically, uh, the, the main purpose of this presentation is to help our physio colleagues to understand how much we can offer for patients with the dizziness um, from uh, from our uh, physio point of view. Of course, vestibular rehabilitation can be offered by a range of health professionals, starting from general practitioners to all the way to neurologists, ENT or, or auto, um, neurotologists. So it can be provided by a lot, a range of health professionals. 
And we physios also can provide a similar service provided if we have competency in doing so. So uh, as I said before, this is basically an introduction to vestibular rehabilitation. And in the next slide, so the, the, the overarching um, objective is to um, understand the importance of uh, VRT and we will be talking about the opportunities and challenges that we face if we want to become a vestibular physio specialist, basically. So in the next slide, what we are going to see is there are, there are um, patients who uh, are so desperate to get some help. In fact, they are so desperate that they, they think they are even dying because the, the dizziness can give such a hard time. But luckily, there are only a, a few um, uh, conditions that can cause um, sinister and uh, uh, life-threatening dizziness. But nevertheless, patients, when they suffer from dizziness, would feel extremely anxious about um, this dizziness. And so on the other hand, if you think about it, we had sent a video um, about happy dizzy, um, Nitish. Or did you have a, a, a video in hand? Yes, sir, I have. So I will play the first one. So is it, um, so I think it's titled happy, video but but anyway if, if okay thank you so so patients with with the dizziness will, will present with nystagmus that are quite quite uh, a telltale sign we, we one can actually identify whether the person suffering from dizziness is suffering from either vbi which is something we physios are quite worried about or is it a benign condition like benign paroxysmal positional vertigo? Or it is a, a central pathology, but it's not a life-threatening pathology. Just by merely looking at the nystagmus, one can actually interpret um, and find out whether it is a um, uh, treatable condition or it's a life-threatening condition. So on the next slide, please. So we'll go back to the presentation with this. Okay, thank you. So, so I just want to present a case scenario here. Let's not speculate whether this was a real case or a, a, um, an imaginary case scenario, but I just want you to focus on this guy, Mr. A, and his journey with the dizziness. Now, about three years ago, he wakes up with the dizziness, a severe dizziness. And after a few hours, it settles, but still hangs in there. So he goes to the doctor, um, his family physician, and the family physician says, right, Mr. A, you are suffering from vertigo. And if you take this tablet for a few days, you should be fine. Then basically his own uh, doctor, the family physician rules out anything sinister. So the patient is confident that he's not uh, suffering from anything sinister and the doctor is also confident the patient is not something uh, suffering from something um, serious life-threatening case as well so patient goes home and takes the medication six months later still he continues to suffer from dizziness but meantime he also develops neck pain and this time he wonders mr a wonders whether his dizziness is related to his neck because he had the neck pain for some time, even before he developed the dizziness. So consequently, he visits a, a physio clinic. And the physiotherapist, while examining, by asking questions, basically, he wonders whether there is a VBI, because the patient says turning head, ro head rotation or flexion makes him dizzy. And he wonders whether it's a VBI, and with caution, he proceeds with his therapy. But his dizziness is not going anywhere. And 10 months later, Mr. A has a fall. 
he had a fall and fractured his hip and he was taken to nearby hospital where he was operated and the health professionals who were involved in managing him knew that his fall was due to the dizziness that he's been suffering for a while during post rehab he was um, reluctant to lie down because it made him dizzy so the physio kindly adjusted the posture did not allow him to lie down because that made him dizzy and modified the therapeutic procedure and helped him to recover and get back home but mr a continued to suffer from dizziness a year later he developed an acute vertigo this time instead of going to the gp mr a went to an emergency department now emergency physician quite rightly examined him for any sinister pathology like posterior circulation stroke vertebral artery dissection now there were no clinical signs to support that so he reassured this patient and gave him medication and sent him home now two months following the initial attendance to the uh, emergency department mr a goes back to the emergency department with another acute attack this time he was tested with an mri so the mri brain scan shows some old ischemic changes now based on that the clinician now decides probably this patient has got a posterior circulation infarct but the trouble is it doesn't explain this old patchy lesion doesn't explain his acute recurrent attacks meanwhile patient also have seen a cardiologist neurologist and an ent surgeon on account of his dizziness but so far no relief okay so next slide please so why do you think in spite of mr a seeing so many health professionals some are of primarily for his dizziness others were aware of his dizziness issues why they were not able to correctly diagnose his dizziness and not able to treat him why do you think uh, this is happening ne next slide please right so perhaps we should pay attention to this statement that was made by an eminent professor some 60 years ago so he was a professor of neurology mr brian matthews professor brian matthews he says there can be few physicians so dedicated to the art of so so to the art that they do not experience a slight decline in spirits on learning that their patient's complaint is dizziness so this is quite quite upsetting isn't it at at a professor level at a neurological a neuro neurology professor level if he says that you know, when he encounters a patient with the dizziness his spirits dips down a little bit you can see the enormity of uh, and the challenge of dealing with patients with the dizziness now we will see why it is so challenging next slide please now as you can see when someone says that he or she is suffering from dizziness we can mean any of this that is present in front of you dizziness can be described in various ways different descriptions now dizziness can also come from can we move on to the next one please can come from vestibular dizziness and non vestibular um, areas as well there are conditions several several conditions within vestibular and literally a few dozen conditions from non vestibular areas such as medication induced medication itself like i think roughly around 400 different medications could cause dizziness as a side effect medical conditions cardiovascular respiratory neurological musculoskeletal it goes on and on so how can we actually be good at everything in this and be able to assess analyze and make a diagnosis and finally treat the patient it's it's a 
it's a Herculean task. Hence, not many clinicians are too keen on getting into the dizziness assessment and management business. Next slide, please. So, when a patient with the dizziness presents to a clinic, of course, assessment, diagnosis, and management should be the process. But the main concern is, is my patient dying because of a cerebrovascular accident? Or could I make it worse if it is a VBI when it comes to physios handling these patients by moving their neck? Will I compromise the blood circulation worse than it is? Uh, so as a result, clinicians often rely on investigations such as CT and MRI. But the problem with CT and MRI when it comes to dizziness, since the dizziness comes from posterior circulation infarct, not hemorrhage very often, mainly infarct, CT brain is useless and waste of money when it comes to finding out whether there is any infarct in the posterior region. MRI can be useful when it's done after 48 hours following the initial attack, which means in the first 24 hours, MRI also can miss any developing infarct. So even though people are quite rightly worried about CVA and VBA, the, the steps that they are taking to address it is not very effective. So CT is not good, MRI is not that sensitive either. So routine approach, one, once the clinician is happy that patient is not suffering from sinister causes, the routine approach typically um, based on symptomatic diagnosis and symptomatic treatment. So a diagnosis of vertigo is often given to patients. Now, vertigo is not a condition. Literally, it means room spinning or head spinning. So, so if someone says that my head is spinning, I give them an equal medical term that is vertigo. It doesn't say more than that. So vertigo cannot be a diagnosis. It's just a symptom. Now, next step is medication. People often offered medication for a symptomatic relief. So as you have seen, how many conditions can actually cause dizziness how can this medication can be an answer for everything? No, but nevertheless, it's helpful for the first three, four days of an initial acute attack to calm the vegetative symptoms. But beyond that, medication doesn't have much role. Next slide, please. Right, so let's have a look at the numbers. How many people are affected by dizziness? Well, dizziness affects across all age group, right from children. I have seen a four, four or five year old child up to 101 year old. So it aff affects across all age group, but also it affects elderly people significantly high. So in between people who are in my age, 40 years and above, about one third of us, seem to be suffering from some sort of vestibular issues. So that's a lot of people around us experiencing vestibular issues. It, they may be asymptomatic, but they could be potentially at risk of falling. That's what we should remember. When it comes to condition-specific data, it's quite clear that peripheral and central vestibular makes up 50%, which means people are suffering from conditions that can be diagnosed and treated by trained vestibular therapists. Okay, now when it comes to diagnosis, currently it takes an average four consultation for a correct diagnosis to be made and successfully treated. And CT, MRI and 24 hour monitor has been relied on quite heavily. Often incorrect diagnosis and misdiagnosis happens. And as a result, incorrect and wrong treatments also offered to patients with the dizziness. And th these things happens because 
people are over relying on symptoms and over relying on imaging studies and these all due to lack of awareness of the, the in-depth vestibular related disorders how can be diagnosed and treated so it all comes down to the lack of awareness but evidence on vestibular rehabilitation is quite high it says it's effective but it's not utilized properly yet next slide please right so so our guy mr a did he get better at all he did eventually he saw a vestibular specialist so the diagnosis was left anterior canal bppv and poor sensory integration this was done with with an hour of assessment a thorough physical subjective as well as physical and vestibular specific assessments uh, at the end he had a diagnosis as to why these dizziness attacks were happening so anterior canal bppv and poor sensory integration and he received treatment for his bppv within two sessions his bppv was completely cured and his balance problem was addressed by customized balance rehab and he improved significantly with a few sessions of that as well next slide please okay so i think it's pertinent now to revisit um thirukural uh, this is i think a thousand years ago um um thiruvallur actually gave us guidelines as to how to approach um uh, how to be a good physician or a healthcare professional he says one should first diagnose the disease find out its cause go back all the way to the root cause even if you, if it's necessary then choose the right treatment now there are a lot of guidelines when it comes to managing dizziness but this simple guideline is really really makes sense you don't treat the condition without knowing what's causing it that's where a lot of our colleagues were failing mr a was not diagnosed properly when he saw his physician because the physician remember said you are suffering from vertigo take this medication vertigo is not a condition so he made a mistake physio he looked at his neck he was worried about vbi but he wasn't able to go deeper to find out what was the reason for his dizziness even though the fall was due to the dizziness the the hip fracture was due to dizziness no one really bothered to investigate why in first place this patient was suffering from dizziness they were all happy that he is taking medication for it and they they thought okay gp is managing and also the fact that the patient was seen by neurologist ent and cardiologist what else can i offer probably that's what they thought but no one until the patient went to the vestibular specialist clinic no one was able to diagnose the disease thereby they couldn't treat it properly okay next one please so what is vestibular rehabilitation so let's have a, uh, the next slide please so vestibular rehabilitation is a specialized form of therapy that is offered by a trained healthcare professional can be a physio neurologist ent audiologist occupational therapist anyone who is trained to provide this service for patients with the dizziness vertigo and unsteadiness that those are the symptoms coming from vestibular disorders in order to reduce these symptoms improve their activities of daily living so one should know what are the symptoms that are produced by are suffered by vestibular disorders and what are the disorders that causes these symptoms then what are the treatments that can be offered customized we cannot give a, give a holistic approach we have to customize it choose the right treatment then with the with, with the set goals is is it the dizziness the patient is bothered about or the unsteadiness 
or is it the activities of daily living that he's not able to do? I don't mind feeling dizzy, but I can't do this because of my unsteadiness. So, so we need to have a patient oriented goal. Next slide, please. So, so we, we get that through vestibular rehabilitation, basically. So when it comes to vestibular rehabilitation, physios should, or any healthcare professional should be aware of the symptoms, then the vestibular specific tests, then conditions that causes these disorders, then the causes of these disorders. Finally, we need to choose the right treatment to address it. Next one, please. Okay, so what does the uh, literature says about vestibular rehabilitation? Vestibular rehabilitation is better than medication. Medication, it's also better than wait and watch approach. Sometimes the, the, the doctors or, or clinicians say, right, let's not worry too much about it. You are not having a stroke. Um, I can assure you that it's just, just simple dizziness. Don't worry about it. You'll wait and watch, but. We don't know how the patient is suffering between during the waiting period. But if you do, if you start the VRT vestibular rehab, it's better than waiting. Now, when you offer customized vestibular, it helps with the balance. It reduces the risk of fall. Then the evidence is quite high for unilateral vestibular hyperfunction and BPPV as well. So BPPV, sometimes patients suffer from it for years. A patient of mine suffered it for 41 years, but with, with one session, she got better. So it's a mechanical problem. You have to just put it back. So it can be that effective. So there is a huge evidence to support the benefits of vestibular rehabilitation. Okay. Thank you. Next one, please. So BPPV, how do we assess and treat? So Dixal Pike um, is the test that we need to do to find out whether the posterior, uh, posterior canal has been involved. There are a few other um, tests that we can do for other canals, but posterior canal BPP being the most common canal that's affected, then Dixal Pike probably should be the first choice. So once we identify uh, that the patient is suffering from BPPV, then we can proceed with epilim maneuver. That is a, a treatment, a particle repositioning maneuver. I was going to show you a couple of videos on how to do Dixal Pike and um, epilim maneuver. And let's see if we can bring that up now. It is. Um, Let me try that, sir. Okay. Okay, so as you can see, the patient is going on a flat supine with the head hanging off the bed. And I would have kept the patient there for a minute, then bringing the patient up there. So, so it's been edited to make it shorter, but yeah, keep it there. And I, I will be looking for nystagmus, uh, nystagmus. So in that position, so Nitesh, if you can just go back to the lying position and pass it there for a second, please. Yeah, okay, so we'll keep it there and we'll pass it there. So now, so in this position, if the patient is suffering from BPPV, it will create nystagmus. Similarly, if the patient is suffering from a VBI, that is vertebrobasilar insufficiency, patient will show nystagmus. Also, certain central um, vestibular pathology, such as um, middle um, midbrain lesion or cerebellar lesion, can produce central nystagmus, positional nystagmus. Now, one can actually differentiate whether it's a BPPV or a VBA or a central positional nystagmus by doing this test. And this test can be a deal breaker if it's because VBI, even though it is there, it's not that common. BPPV is the most common cause of positional vertigo. So if you are able to rule out VBI, then confidently you can proceed to um, get rid of the BPPV. 
Okay, this is an, an important um, uh, test that one, one should learn. Okay, next one, please. So do we have um, a preliminary videos, video in the, um, did I send you Nitesh? Nitesh? Ah, uh, okay. So this is, um, okay, so th this is not the video that I want to sh show you now, but we will, let, let's watch it. These, these guys are, we will we'll watch it still. These guys are, these guys are happily dizzy. Can you see? Some are drunk, some are going on uh, raids, and they are not bothered about the dizziness. In fact, they are paying to get dizzy. Yeah, but remember, patients who suffer from dizziness, who come to us for help, they are not like these guys. They are not enjoying that dizziness. They are desperate to get some help. So we need to move away from, ah, dizziness. This is just a little setback. You will get better. I know what dizziness is. That kind of attitude we should move away from. Okay. So now, perhaps I will show you the Apple maneuver later on. Uh, we will sort out the videos uh, in a bit. But what are the challenges and opportunities that we have. Now, first of all, from the patient's point of view, because of lack of VRT specialist availability, not many in there. I, I have a few patients from India coming online for consultation and they say how desperate they are because there aren't any uh, vestibular uh, trained specialists around there. So, so so patients have really huge challenge because we are not equipping ourselves to become a specialist. So as a result, often patients have to go through incorrect diagnosis, maybe more than one diagnosis, and incorrect treatments. And most importantly, they are suffering from ongoing symptoms. So that's the challenge our patients have experience, right? As a clinician, what are the challenges do we face? Well, lack of awareness is a main challenge we have. And insufficient training. I don't remember studying vestibular rehabilitation when I was doing my undergraduate. Even when I, when I was doing my postgraduate neurology, I didn't really pay much attention to the vestibular rehab because I didn't have mentors who would be able to explain this in a simple language. So no, no insufficient training, lack of mentors, and people who know a little bit about vestibular stuff, vestibular disorders, they rely on wrong paradigm. They, they talk about symptoms rather than relying on the specific tests. Also, clinicians rely on other specialists. For example, if, if a patient who comes with the dizziness, if, if the patient has already seen a neurologist or ENT specialist for dizziness, I could be thinking, okay, if they have been to a specialist at that level, what else can I offer? Well, if that particular neurologist didn't know enough about vestibular disorders, he's going to get it wrong. Yeah, as simple as that. So you don't rely on other specialists. Do your own clinical skills. Now, another most important challenge in this Dr. Google and Dr. YouTube era is that patients come with a lot of information. Sometimes they know more than we do because they are the one who suffer from it 24 seven and they read a lot. They may not be able to get the right diagnosis for themselves, but they are equipped with a lot of information. And if you don't know what you're talking about, they are going to challenge you. Right? So these are the challenges we face. And the next one, please. So the opportunities. Well, by now, probably you would have actually guessed if you can train yourself, not necessarily at a super specialist level, even at a basic level, 
if you ask the right, right questions, if you know what kind of symptoms the patient is suffering from, what are the triggers, then you will be able to signpost the patient to the right specialist because you will know whom to send. If you know a little bit about the condition, you will then know who is offering the service. So you will be signposting to the um, signposting the patient to the right specialist. Also, you can train yourself to provide basic level assessment and treatment. As your interest grows, you can become a specialist. You can also deal with complex and rare vestibular conditions. So there are immense opportunities. Now, a lot of patients are suffering from dizziness unnecessarily, and you can be the one who can actually give them the helping hand. So next slide, please. Right, so in conclusion, dizziness is a common symptom often suffered by or caused by vestibular disorders. In routine practice, it's often symptomatic and, and medication route, which is ineffective. Patients see unnecessarily multiple specialists, multiple consultations, and often they rely on, the clinicians rely on MRI and CT scan, which are not very sensitive. But the one uh, practice that's really effective, that is VRT, is not routinely practiced. Okay, so I would encourage any health professional who is dealing with patients should become aware of dizziness. And as a physiotherapist, I would encourage our fellow colleagues to be acute and become specialists, at least some of you from here, to provide the much needed service to the patients. And the next one, please. Right, if you want more information, resources, there are two books. That's, uh, the, they are my favorites. There are several books on dizziness and these are my favorite. The, the first one, dizziness, is a small one, easy to read. And I would suggest uh, that for big, beginners. Vestibular Rehabilitation, next one is by Dr. Uh, Susan Herdman. It's a fantastic book, but it's a really uh, a, a big and tough one, okay? There are a few online uh, resources available as well, and you can actually make use of them, right? And once again, thank you guys. Uh, we will see if we can get the video um, set up uh, in, in a bit. Over to you, Nitesh. I can't hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? I can hear you now, yeah. Thank you, sir. It was such a comprehensive and so easy to understand, uh, you know, this complex topic. Uh, you have presented it really well. And I suppose the suggested reads are going to be read by people now. So uh, before we uh, go on to uh, John sir's uh, presentation, um, I would like to tell all the attendees one thing that because of certain technical issues, we are not going live today or we are not able to, you know, actually uh, on the Facebook. So um, you can share your uh, emails that we had sent you for the ID and password of the Zoom meeting so they can also access that. So uh, now uh, going over to uh, John Sir, I would like to introduce him. Uh, he is uh, an associate professor in Manipal Academy of Higher Education. And he completed his uh, master's degree uh, with uh, his specialization being in neurological physiotherapy in 2003. And he has a PhD on virtual reality training for in coordination from Mahe itself uh, in uh, 2010. He is a certified vestibular rehab therapist and uh, is the in charge of the balance in vestibular clinic and neurosurgery patients at the Kasturba Hospital in Manipal. He has more than 19 years of teaching and clinical experience with his work focusing mainly on the vestibular rehab, the motor control, and the virtual reality training after stroke. And uh, he's an AVID researcher. He's a member of various international working groups on stroke rehab. I welcome you, sir. I will. Uh... Hello, sir. So, Hello, sir. Thank you very much for the uh, 
introduction. And uh, I take this opportunity to thank uh, the uh, organizers of this uh, webinar, especially the uh, institution and also thanks to even Dr. Raju Patricia, the president of SIP. Uh, I'll just try to share my PPT now. Let's see if the share I have. Is it shared? Yes, it is starting, sir. Yes, we can see it, sir. Okay, is it visible? So is, is it visible in slideshow? Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, everybody, uh, I, in this session, I'm going to talk on gaming rehabilitation. Uh, for one of the particular, uh, the Samis are also mentioned about this, this function, which is a very common disorder. Uh, uh, other than next to to BPPV in, when it comes to peripheral vestibular disorders. Uh, so I'm going to talk in the next 20 minutes. Uh, my objectives are to recall certain motor output mechanisms of vestibular system, which is important to understand what happens after a unilateral vestibular hyperfunction. So that we know and describe its features, a uh, bit about its recovery mechanism, and uh, we'll uh, discuss a couple of brief assessments that are done during a UDH and what's the common way to develop uh, adaptation exercises and how does now gaming rehabilitation uh, be used in treating these disorders. Uh, so, vestibular system, when we say vestibular system, it includes the vestibular apparatus, which is there in your inner ear. When you're talking about the uh, nerve, vestibular nerve, the nuclei that is there in the brainstem. And uh, the brainstem nucleus connects to various areas, both into the brain, uh, to the eye, to the spinal cord, so it, and uh, many other centers. So, but there are two more major motor outputs that come from these systems. That is, one is vestibular ocular reflex and the vestibular spinal reflex. So, vestibular ocular reflex is a, a reflex mechanism where, when, when you are trying to focus on an object, when you are trying to move your head, there is a when the head is moving, there is a compensatory eye movement that helps you to stabilize the gaze so that we can see things more clearly. So, it's a very important function uh, of the vestibular system so that the images that we see do not move so that we can understand our environment more clearly depend upon what we see and align ourselves accordingly. So it's uh, important in one way that to trust the visual input, you need to have a good case stability. The second output mechanism, uh, yeah, uh, and how it has, this mechanism has to be a very good mechanism. That is, it has to happen very quickly. Uh, in the previous slide, I just showed a, uh, the mechanism uh, in a picture on the left side. That is, for example, when you're moving the head to the left side, the left uh, semicircular canal gets excited, the right gets inhibited. When the left gets excited, the impulse is carried from the vestibular apparatus to the vestibular nuclei, and from there, the output goes through the third nerve and the sixth nerve on the opposite side to create appropriate eye movements. Now, this has to be happening in a very, very quick manner. Only then the image will remain stable, and that is what is called as vestibular gain. That is, uh, it is a change. It's a it's a ratio between the change in the eye's uh, velocity to that of the uh, head movement. So, when you do a quick movement, depending upon the speed of head, that same speed that speed the eye should move, and it's good when the gain is ratio is at one. But when it is becoming, uh, when there is a hypofunction, what happens is that the uh, vestibular gain comes down, and the people and the person affected with the unilateral vestibular hypofunction finds it difficult to fix the gaze off at a particular point, and they will miss it, and they will take time to correct their eye. So thereby creating a uh, slight oscillopsia or uh, visual blurring that they might have. 
the second output mechanism is the vestibular spinal reflex how uh, the first output mechanism focused on gait stability the second output mechanism focuses on postural stability that is uh, the mainly the equilibrium reactions uh, this comes into action especially when our feet is not on a firm surface when you are sitting on an unstable uh, uh, sitting on something with your feet off the ground or when you are standing on an unstable surface for example when you are standing on a board or something uh, your vestibular system brings about these equilibrium reactions so that the head can remain stable or vertical and the rest of the body gets aligned accordingly and this is executed through the lateral vestibular spinal tract and medial vestibular spinal tract along with the reticular spinal tract and when there is the hypofunction the ability to create these equilibrium reactions get affected and that by creating postural instability john sir can you be a yes. little louder can you be a little louder uh, okay uh, uh, are you able to hear better now yes sir you can uh, be a little louder you know keep your mic a little here yeah that's what i'm i'm trying to hold it uh, hold the mic just next to my mouth is how how loud uh, should i be louder than this if there is an issue from some other people i'll let you know now it is sounding okay. better okay yeah i'm going to be talking a little louder so that everyone hears and i'm keeping my mic closer as well okay so unilateral vestibular hypofunction or dysfunctions can be caused due to many causes um it often uh, the most commonest cause are the vestibular neuritis and labyrinthinitis both are inflammations are uh, related to the lab uh, where well, one first one related to the vestibular nerve and the second one related to the labyrinth or the membranous labyrinth and both of this uh, are very easily treatable and uh, this basically uh, the uh, initial medical management involves uh, um in, involves giving uh, uh, anti vertiginous drugs or uh, anti inflammatory drugs or sometimes steroids and depending upon the cause they may be giving a uh, antibiotic or so so that that can bring the uh, symptoms down and acoustic neuroma where there is a, a tumor which is post surgically patient may have symptoms and also in case of meniscus and proceed and when it comes to hypofunctioning the first three conditions are the most common conditions where uh, uh, one side may not be functioning appropriately so in the acute stages of this dysfunction a uh, patient may have severe vertigo for that lasts for hours there will be a lot of uh, disequilibrium and sometimes even uh, you know uh, like a kind of vomiting or vomiting sensation and they may have vomiting as well which gets uh, aggravated with head movements and after the medications that i spoke to you about in the inflammation phase uh, after 3 to 4 days usually it kind of comes down and they enter into a subacute phase where the vertigo now is not constant but it comes whenever you move the head and once you move uh, it persists for a few minutes and they present with mild balance dysfunctions as well they are unable to, whenever they move their head they feel like they are losing balance or when they are walking they are walking towards one side so these are some of the aspects that you see after the initial subs uh, once the inflammation has subsided and uh, but when the during this phase subacute phase there is a natural recovery process that happens that is the brain uh calibrates the firing mechanisms and starts ad uh, adjusting the firing so that eventually there is some compensation but if it is not done along with proper training or proper head movements then there may be even in chronic conditions after the 2 to 3 months after 3 months also patient may still have some amount of vertigo and imbalance whenever they do some quick movements okay so these are some of the features that they may be finding it so what happens in the in very initial stages the acute stages that will be static imbalance that is uh, there is a continuous firing of the vestibular uh, nerve and then they feel very uh, dizzy but uh, in the later phases uh, only during head movements and uh, in the earlier movements earlier times in the uh, earlier phase of the disease 
the dystagmus uh, is seen very well, even at rest. There is a, a feeling of lateral pulsion. Patient has a affected visual vertical. And there is also the ocular tilt reaction. That is sometimes there the one eye is slightly downward rotated and that the other one. Whereas these symptoms usually subside in UVH uh, after the acute phase. And only dynamic imbalance is seen. That is these two things, which I spoke to you about in the beginning. That is vestibular ocular reflex asymmetry, where the patient is unable to fix the gaze properly. There is an affected vestibular gain. And second one, they have a postural instability. That is, they are unable to balance properly. So usually when these patients come, uh, a couple of tests that we, that, uh, we use to identify uh, these mechanism, involvement of these two mechanism, uh, the first one is the head thrust test. Um, what we do is we ask the patient to, uh, with the therapist stands in front, ask them to look towards your nose and then move their head quickly to any one side and then see whether they are able to fix the case. And you will realize uh, when there is a hypofunction, when you turn the head towards the hypofunctioning side, the patient is unable to fix the gaze properly. They keep missing the target. They will miss looking at the nose and then later they will correct it. You will see what is called as a corrective uh, saccades. Uh, and that helps you to identify that there is a unilateral hypofunction on to which side as well. This is one of the tests. I'm just talking about a couple of tests that are very important. Other than other, the other ones we are not talking at this point of time. The second one is uh, the one where we do a modified clinical test for sensor interaction of balance. Uh, this test is a modification of the sensory organization testing as uh, uh, proposed. And basically, you are going to make the patient stand in four conditions. First condition with eyes open. Then you're going to ask them to close their eyes. So they have to depend upon proprioception only and, and vestibular system and maintain balance. In the third system, they are going to make them stand on a foam and see if they can maintain balance. In the third system, uh, they are relying on vision and vestibular. And if there is some dysfunction, there may be some sway there also because the gaze stability is also not proper. And the last phase, the patient is going to close their eyes and stand on a foam. Now, this is the position in which uh, the patient has to completely rely on the vestibular inputs to maintain balance. Patient with hypofunctioning may not rely, uh, create appropriate uh, reactions. Even in normal, there will be some amount of sway. That is, what will happen is when you make them stand, they'll start swaying slowly. The, uh, and uh, it's not sensed easily well by the feet because feet is already very... Um, move, um, it's moving already and you're not relying on the feed. When the head starts moving, the person understands and tries to correct it. And then they, that's why that sway is created. And you can observe the sway even in normal. But what happens in UVH patients are that they don't realize it till a large amplitude of movement is created. So sometimes they tend to sway a lot or sometimes they even lose balance in that last uh, condition. So these are important tests clinical tests that are used to elicit the motor output mechanism dysfunctions seen in UVH. And, and that's where uh, when you rehabilitate uh, unilateral vestibular hypofunction patients, your focus is on regaining these two functions to improve gaze stability and to improve postural stability. The most common uh, mechanism by which the uh, vestibular system in you after a uvh recovers is through an adaptation mechanism that is whenever you look at a, a point or a, try to focus it and then when you try to move your head there you in case if the person is unable to focus properly and there is a image slipping then that acts as an error signal okay so the image moves in the retina because it's because not stable, we move your head and the image also suddenly moves, then that is triggers an error signal. And this hypothesis proposes that there is what is called as a teaching light from the cerebellum that controls the firing rate of the vestibular nuclei, which can alter its firing rate for that particular speed when you keep repeating again and again. So eventually, 
at one point the nucleus understands how it has to send the firing so that the retinal slip or the image slip does not happen and that's how the vestibular nucleus learns to create appropriate eye movements so that the they can fix the uh, eye uh, i mean vision in a stable position so usually this is common uh, many therapists would know this how to give these exercises which are nothing uh, but uh, uh, gaze fixation exercises but before doing that it's important to ensure the patient has a proper dynamic visual input that is they can move the eye properly and then they do not have any cerebral posterior cerebral involvement or cerebellar involvement so that the adaptation mechanism can work usually you use a stimulus that is written on a card or you can even write something on the wall and stick it and ask the patient to look at it and then move the head either side up down sideways you incorporate different directions of movement and try to ask the patient to keep trying to look at the card and try to ensure the vision is uh, clear you can sometimes even use a tip of a thumb line so you ask them to hold the hand in front ask them to look at the base of the thumb look at and do the same movements or it can be any natural environment i can look at a, a switch that is there in front focus on the switch and do the movement or even a leaf or a flower so the idea is to focus uh, on something and ensure that the image doesn't try to keep the image in position and uh, so the main focus is that you should incorporate eye movement and head movement initially start with minimal head movement and then gradually you perform at different frequencies and this should be always performed at the patient's ability, limits of ability uh, that is you don't do you go till the point where the patient feel uncomfortable and then you stop and give a break and then you further do more exercises uh, similarly vestibulospinal reflexes when we talk about that you're going to make the person you one part of it is to make the ex, perform the gaze stabilization exercises on so while sitting an uh, unstable surface or standing on an unstable surface like uh, sitting on a vestibular ball or by on a soft soggy uh, foam and then do the same exercises and bring in the vestibular spinal reflexes as well usually the progression includes walking exercises where you fix the gaze on a particular point and move the head and walk and sometimes even shift the gaze between alternate points and walk now these are various uh, uh, these are basic mechanisms and you build up on this and create set of exercises according to the patient and these vestibular adaptation exercises have shown to reduce the patient's uh, symptoms of vertigo and also to improve uh, the balance and gait functions of these patients and we have a cochrane review to support its evidence now moving on so we have something already available that is a tool that works but there are times that comes uh, that is challenging that is uh, we need to do for alternatives where patient can uh, be many of the time we see patients not adhering to exercises or initially they'll do or then they will stop they get bored when doing these exercises and uh, they're not motivated to do sometimes it looks very typical i mean repetitive boring exercises so sometimes adherence and doing the exercises correctly becomes a challenge and that's where sometimes uh, bringing in a game aspect to keep it interesting and motivated uh, is uh, also important and um, that's where we can probably even sometimes use what we do is after the first couple of weeks we even teach the patient some recreational activities it is related to after the initial adaptation happens you can ask the patients to do uh, activities like throwing and catching a ball or involve themselves in playing any uh, racket games such as badminton or tennis because they are going to focus on the ball as it goes up they are going to look up move their head focus on the ball and so there is movement of head movement of i mean focus of eye and also movement of body that's a very challenging thing involving vor and uh, vestibular spinal reflex both 
and these doing these activities keeps the vestibular system more active and so um, there are now problems in going out and playing we have to go to something uh, more uh, home based the challenges of covid has started coming in we have to look at situations what can that we make the patients do at home and probably achieve the same thing and keep them interested doing such things at home uh there are now commercially available vr game systems you are you should you will be aware of these systems uh the two there are many but the two most important ones are the v and the kinex system uh v system uh, has always been uh, pioneers in using their system for rehab so v rehab itself is a very popular term and these are normal gaming system that can be installed at home connected to a tv and people can play games in this now that is something that you are going to make make them uh, interested and do something similarly you have xbox kinect uh, you right they have xbox kinect 2 now and these are game, games that are off shelf it's not rehab uh, things off shelf that are available at home there are rehab ones like gintronics mind motion but uh, i think they are more important when it comes to brain injured patients stroke patients where it's very important to uh, lower the level of activity that they can perform which is not available in a off shelf one but whereas when it comes to a vestibular rehab part you don't have to have it too low as well you can actually use shelf normal gaming comes to incorporate in training uh, patients with uh, vestibular uh, dysfunctions like uh, ileal vestibular hyperfunction so that's where we did a study years back in uh, 2013 14 we did a study uh, to identify the effect of kinect based virtual reality gaming training on balance and functions in persons with unilateral vestibular hypofunction it was a post graduate study done by taken up by uh, ms sanjana rao presently she is doing her phd in us and uh, we did uh, conduct the study and that's what i'm going to introduce it and but this study we did not do it at that point uh, thinking for a, a, i mean a, a, as a home based treatment but as a clinic based treatment but i believe uh, in the present situation i think it is more meaningful to understand how this could work and probably encourage patients to do such activities at home itself so we uh, started the study to determine the effect of a kinetic based virtual reality system uh, to test its effect on unilateral vestibular hypofunction uh, in to improve uh, to see how it affects gait balance and intensity of dizziness it was a assessor blinded parallel group randomized control trial and we did it in our clinic vestibular and balance rehabilitation unit at department of physiotherapy kasturba hospital we chose patient using a purpose sampling we chose only those who are diagnosed with unilateral vestibular hypofunction by the uh, ent we had confirmed and we double confirmed using the uh, head thrust test to ensure that the vestibular gain is affected and only those patients were in involved in this study the age range was between 18 to 65 years of both gender we excluded if the patient had bppv because bppv we are going to treat them like how uh, sami sir said you no know, you can do a please maneuver or some other maneuver based on the canal that is affected and we excluded any other vestibular disorders cervical disorders as well neurological dysfunctions vbi musculoskeletal dysfunctions and medical conditions we excluded and chose only those with hypofunction we used we require we recorded their postural sways using a static posturegraphy and we used a basic gaming uh, xbox 360 with kinect for training these patients after obtaining approval we screened for uh, the selection criteria obtained an informed consent and then we randomly divided them into two groups and then we took the baseline uh assessment i'll explain the baseline as what all we took later but basically we looked at gait balance and amount of amount of vertigo that they have they using a vas they had to grade how in out of i mean in a scale of 10 cm how much do they perceive the uh, dizziness so the control group we went to the standard adaptation exercises that I explained in the beginning how it should be done starting with 
uh, card, giving them gaze exercises and progressing them to also standing uh, and walking exercises. In the experimental group, we chose to do the activities uh, using a Kinect-based VR gaming training and Xbox training. So they have to initially start looking at the game, just look at the game for a while, move their head either side. Then slowly we made them involve in the game and made them do the exercises with the games. And uh, we tested again after the, at the end of two weeks. So uh, we used a typical one uh, uh, that was uh, there were games. This were this is something called as a um, that, uh, river raft. River raft game is one. We used ra uh, rally ball. Uh, there were some twenty thousand leagues, something called as that, which basically involves the patient to look at the screen, move their body, probably even sometimes jump are bend sit down get up and so many activities were there that involved them so but the therapist you might have noticed the uh, hands so the therapist is there behind ensuring that there is no uh, chance of fall so it's done in a very safe way so at this time as i told you it was done at the lab sitting in our uh, unit uh we did this program for three times a week for two weeks initial sessions ranged around uh, 20 minutes with rest and uh, sometimes 30 minutes at the end of the week. Sometimes at the end of the two weeks, we could go up to 40 minutes. Um, and it was all based on patient's ability and tolerance. So we cannot, we, it is not at a fixed time that this many movements, this many uh, uh, repetitions, we cannot fix because it is, all depends upon patient's tolerance and at what point they feel their symptoms. So we recorded our the functional gait assessment. We recorded a postural sway, and we also recorded the visual analog uh, uh, scale for dizziness. And we did the statistical analysis. We screened 40 patients for in, uh, selection, and then we ended up at the end having 11 patients in both the groups. Both the groups were almost comparable at baseline. Um, most of them come came to us after the first week of uh, the initial symptoms. So by the time they had recovered from the initial acute severe vertigo and the movement, they were having vertigo only on movement. So they were probably the first week after the initiation and you can see the other demographic characteristics. The functional gait assessment showed a significant improvement, especially in the Kinect group. Um, the median score was seven compared to the uh, experiment, I mean, uh, the control group, which is five. But if you look at the range, intercord range is six to nine. So um, though we had a statistical significance, uh, we still would say, we'd be cautious to say that uh, it was completely, uh, it was not completely that the VR, uh, the VR training group was much more, but there seems to be a median range at which they are much better. When we looked at the postural sway, this was done by making them, uh, like uh, I told you about the clinical test for sensory integration balance, that is eyes open, eyes closed, on the foam, standing. This we did it on the posturography machine and we recorded how much they sway. And what we observed was the patients in the uh, via gaming rehab uh, did very well with eyes closed conditions, both on firm surface and also on foam surface, which was something that we were surprised with. That is their ability to move, uh, control the sway was much better when it came to eyes closed condition. And we also see the similar trend whenever it came to um, uh, even eyes open foam, it was uh, uh, better. In, uh, in terms of the velocity moment. But uh, when it came to the last part, that is eyes open, foam, eyes open and eyes closed, we didn't see much of change. They still had some amount of sway velocity. But the dizziness level probably uh, kind of reduced in both the groups significantly from six to almost one and zero. Again, I would say it's could say by almost an equal reduction in both the groups, though there was a statistically significant difference it was a difference of one point. Uh, 
we looked at when we look at the literature there are many studies done using v system kinect systems we just wanted to look back at one important study a uh, uh, larger study done by herdman where they did a similar study and then they said uh, compared to uh, adaptation exercises uh, we are based balance exercises were not superior uh, to the uh, uh, conventional balance exercises but they said it provided more enjoyable method of retraining balance in the unilateral vestibular loss and that we agree with it the the balance changes at a functional level we could not see much of a difference but in our study we could see it a sway level there were some differences much better than the uh, normally trained group and so was the gait uh, uh, functional gait assessment as well so we from our study we felt that kinetic based virtual reality gaming is an effective training method to improve functional gait performance and balance in persons with unilateral vestibular hyperfunction now the challenge to all of us is to see how we can use this opportunity to convert it to a home based training or a tele rehab mode of a training which is i think where we are going to step into now and we need to find ways and test whether feasibility its safety and how effective it could be and i like something that is everyone uh, all next as researchers we will be, we should be starting to look at and find ways to implement it appropriately so that is it from uh, for my talk on this topic and i thank again sap wish you all fathers a happy fathers day and everyone a happy international yoga day stay safe stay healthy stay at home and be safe thank you and i'll ready to take questions sir. Yeah. Ah, uh, some part I don't hear you. And mute yourself, please. Oh, oh, I'm so sorry. I said it was a very interesting presentation, especially because you have given us uh, an uh, alternative for the very boring exercises. I think uh, physios also and our patients also will be very happy with the idea. Um. but i think there are some concerns about the uh, you know uh, gaming expenditure and all the connect is not so uh, you know cheap so anyways i suppose um, dr arokya sami uh, sir would you like to play a video before we go on to the question and answer session sure sure yeah. uh, th thank you once again guys we are really sorry about the technical issues that we faced and i somehow managed to send the video of apple and now um uh, ritesh is going to play it for us okay so once once uh, bppv of posterior canal uh, canalithiasis has been diagnosed and the treatment for that is is an apple maneuver so where you get the patient in supine lying with head hanging off the bed but you should support the head uh, properly so from the side of involvement to you turn the patient all the way to the other side in in series of movements so it it literally takes about 5 minutes to complete the the whole procedure so the idea is to get the crystals that are floating in the canal back into where they come from which is within the otolith another part of the inner ear so we are in the last stage of epile so from here patient is going to sit up so now so by by seeing the test that we carried out to diagnose bpp which is dixalpike and and the epile maneuver that you just now seen it seems very simple now it's simple because um we know what what to look for the contraindications uh, most important one and also uh, we have to begin with the proper diagnosis now nowadays everybody thinks with uh, that, that they have bppv if they have vertigo now it may be true but is it a posterior canal is it a canalithiasis or cupolithiasis what about our mr a who did not have posterior canal which is the most common he had a, a bppv in his anterior canal and epile is not going to be helpful for that 
So it's all about learning the symptoms, disorders, how to test, how to diagnose. Then your job becomes easy in treating it. So it's like you spend hours and hours investigating. Finally, you give an injection, which is a few seconds, right? But no, not, not everyone can give can be given the medication without actually going through the due process. It, it applies the same here as well. Don't think everyone has got BPPV and go for a Dixal, I mean, epilim maneuver straight away, do a, a proper assessment and treatment. Sometimes the crystals can move from one canal to another. So we need to be careful on that as well. So, but anyway, we have seen the uh, um, Dixal Pike and epilim maneuver and if you learn how to do it, um, if you know how to, first of all, diagnose it, it can be a, a satisfying job to do. Okay. So now um, there are a few questions people have asked. Um, so is it okay if I start answering some of the questions? So I suppose you can start uh, with the few. Okay. So, right. Um, I'll start from. Okay, so a very interesting question. How to differentiate BPPV, VBI, and, and central based on, on nystagmus? Well, we can talk about nystagmus for half a day. Then we can talk about how to use the skills to differentiate those three conditions. So as you can imagine, it is a completely new aspect. Um, so it's a topic uh, that needs to be uh, concentrated on uh, before we 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 uh, learn how to use it. Yeah. Um, so I unfortunately I won't be able to answer that question um, in a way that's going to be helpful for you now. Except that we need to learn more about nystagmus. The next question is: Can you please explain adaptation exercise? That's to John. I will pass this over to John. Yes, sir. John, sir, can you answer that? Yeah. Okay, uh, so vestibular adaptation exercises basically uh, involve, as I told you, two things. The main thing is gaze fixation. So you have to have something for a patient to look at. So you keep looking at, for example, the tip of your finger, focus it, and move your head. So is there an up, down, or sideways, lateral? So you have to incorporate six, your roll movement in different position, in sitting, standing, and then you're also incorporating vestibular spinal equilibrium, that is equilibrium uh, related one. So you make them sit on unstable surfaces, make them fix their gaze, create more instability, and then gradually you are trying to make the vestibular system uh, calibrate itself through the help of cerebellum to fix the gaze properly. So the adaptation exercises uh, should, are those exercises that involve a, uh, head movement with gaze fixation along with balance. Okay. Yes, sir. So can you tell us when we can move on to the uh, you know prescription of the exercises as self exercises to the uh, patient because uh, they do have symptoms. So when is the time that we can hand hand it over to the patient? Uh, shall I answer that? Yes, sir. Please. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so usually if the first uh, week or so, uh, uh, we make the patient give them the basic exercises. Some of the part of it is done at home itself. Uh, they have to do it in sitting only. The supervision part is required when they start doing the exercise in standing. So um, it's better if they come to the clinical setup at that time uh, and they have uh, you therapist is there while they do doing the exercises. When they are stable enough, at, at least uh, when they're able to do the normal head movements and they don't lose balance, usually by the second or third week or so, we teach them exercises after which they do it at home. The idea is that there are a couple of uh, uh, instructions that we give. We tell try to stay just close to the wall behind. I mean, you should stand in front of the wall when you do the exercise. In case you go back also, there is not of a, much of a problem. Second thing, we also advise them in case if you feel suddenly very busy or something, don't try to grab something by the side. 
because what you're seeing there is not going to be there at that point because the image has moved. Rather, you try to squat and sit down and close your eyes and squat and sit down to avoid any kind of balance, uh, I mean, uh, fall or kind of any chance of fall. But usually, independent exercises we advise after the third week or so. Uh, I, I can, I mean, uh, Samisa, what's your opinion? How, when do you usually in your clinic uh, start giving independent exercises? So, so the home exercise basically, well, well, patients with, with vestibular disorders um, will, will start recovering by themselves through the help of cerebellum. So the recovery process starts from, from initial few hours itself. That's how the natural recovery sets in. Now, as John said, there will be motion intolerance. Head movements will make them dizzy. But any movements that makes them dizzy will become a treatment tool itself. So because of the dizziness, the patients are not moving, our, our job is to ask them to move, but move it in a safer way. For example, if the patient is very reluctant to get out of the bed because of the severity of dizziness, we should ask them to at least sit up on the bed. If they are able to sit up, but they don't want to get out of the bed, maybe with support, we can ask them to get up. So these are the uh, few little things, maybe even few minutes of doing this is going to be helpful. Now, the exercises that we are giving is because the, the vision and proprioception along with cerebellum is helping for the natural recovery to begin with. But later on, vision and proprioception can become a dominant force on, on hindering the vestibular system uh, from its full potential recovery. So our job mainly is to, to look at how vision and proprioception is overdoing, over-dominating, and gradually eliminate this vision and proprioceptive dominance so that the vestibular system can be fully improved. So we can then de devise the exercises um, based on that and give them, well, any activities that they can do at home safely will be good, but we, we shouldn't overdrive the cerebellum as well. So little often, any activities that they can do, it will be good. Now, one, one small example, if, if, if a labyrinthitis or vestibular neuritis is aff affected by yeah, a young woman, young, young lady, young mother, basically, a mother who has to look after her child gets well quickly, sooner, because her, of her mothering responsibility. She has to get up no matter what's happening. So the, the, the natural uh, recovery is quite good um, for young, young parents. Um, but uh, when it comes to elderly people, it takes long because of fear of falling. They don't want to fall and break bones. So the anxiety um, is there for the elderly people. Even though younger people can have anxiety, they can actually overcome it um, by engaging in activities. Yeah, just a, um, so that's from my point of view. Okay, so some more questions people have asked. One of the questions from the, uh, you know, questions the people have asked. Okay. Um, what are the guidelines uh, available for vestibular rehab? Okay, all they have to do is uh, consult Dr. Google. So Google, I, so you know, uh, I think um, as as John said, uh, Cochrane review is available. Systematic review is available for unilateral hyperfunction, and clinical guidelines for BPPV that was originally done in 2018. I uh, uh, sorry, eight. Now in 17 or 18, updated one available on Barani Society uh, for Vestibular Disorders have given a lot of um, literatures on it. So Google is your best teacher. I think there is some, somebody else asked uh, what are the resources available and where can I get trained? Yes, um, that's the main question. I suppose everyone wants to know from where they can get trained. Okay. Especially in India. So in, 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 in training, there are three, three things involved. Uh, the person who can teach, and the resources and the person who wants to be taught. So the, the learner. Learner basically can learn by using online resources. Doesn't have to go to a particular training if it's not available. If it's available, please go ahead. But you don't have to wait for any particular training to, to become a vestibular therapist. All, all you have to do is be competent in, um, in yourself by, by reading and practicing 
of course there are online contents there are um courses available I, i don't know about in india there are courses available in europe and in america um so in 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 the age of webinar i'm sure a lot of um people will be offering vestibulary hub courses and um, so so the main thing is um you have to invest a lot of time and effort in in learning this basic basic skills um it took a while for us to actually get where we are uh, because uh, when you don't have mentors mainly if you can't talk to someone who can guide you um it can be quite challenging but um uh, people can uh, ask me question they got my email if they have if they have any questions in dealing with patients they can always get, i'm sure mr john will also be happy to support yes sir uh, regarding that i will answer both the questions one is related to the guidelines there are guidelines uh, published by apta again in google only you will get it, it, it but it has clearly defined for each condition in tabular form what exactly has to be done what should not be done as well and what is the level of written for each of that uh, i can share it with uh, uh, uh the so sip group if there is some way to connect to everyone I, that can be shared with others as well uh in terms of uh, training um there are two points uh, as you said there is no certification program as of now in india uh even we had to go abroad only and do it but then uh, there is a particular uh, opinion paper that came in journal of vestibular research uh quite some time back that said uh, that you do not require a certification to do a be a vestibular therapist but you need to have knowledge and skill in certain criteria they have listed certain criteria so many of the workshops um, should ideally have those components and uh, probably uh, with the guy again some practical workshops along with some guidance from uh, clinical people i think you can you should be able to do it um we used to uh, we used to conduct a few here i have got i used to conduct outside as well but now i don't think the situations are not right i don't know um, when we will have a similar workshops coming up but we are planning to think uh, we are in the thought of starting some uh, online courses uh, in that one of that is definitely uh, a vestibular rehabilitation course uh, with the he- with the help of our uh, ent department and speech and hearing we have also started a center for uh, vertigo and we have vestibular rehabilitation and we are trying to come up with courses that would probably help others to learn more so we'll wait and see maybe another 6 months or so okay thank you sir i think we can take one more question um and one of you can answer this the question uh, is from one of the attendees and you know uh, that person wants to know how do we differentiate between uh, cupulolithiasis and uh, unilateral vestibular hypofunction on the basis of symptoms okay so let, let me answer that you cannot you cannot differentiate based on the symptoms you have to go deeper to, than that you should be able to do the test that john was talking about head thrust you should be able to do the dixal pike test so head thrust is for hypofunction and positional test for cupolithiasis only then you can decide whether it is this or that you cannot diagnose a disorder well to some extent positional vertigo if patient says or oh, lying down turning over makes me dizzy it can be a bppv but you can only confirm it by doing a test so um so unfortunately we can't differentiate specifically copolithiasis and hypo based on the symptoms alone yes sir thank you for answering it uh, john sir do you want to add something to it uh yeah no i completely agree with uh, uh, sami sir that you can't only uh, it symptoms guides you through the evaluation that you want to do uh, like as i said bpp patients sometimes give a very clear history uh, so and then but then you still have to decide whether it is posterior canal anterior canal or not and similarly when it comes to uh, hypofunctioning we need to do the um, we have a head thrust as the possible dynamic initial activity testing and two other tests to confirm for sure that it is uh, we had said so just history alone may not help us it guides us to what we should assess 
a night in Cuba. Okay. Yes, sir. So, no, no. Um, I, I really appreciate your your effort, guys. Um, you in this you know difficult time with Corona, COVID, lockdown, and everything. Uh, Society of, of Physiotherapy is uh, trying their best. So, um, thank you for inviting me over. I'm really happy that I was able to share my um, experience with you guys. Um, so, in future, probably we will meet up again. Yeah. Just thank for being, you know, for accepting uh, this uh, talk, and uh, it has been a delight to have both of you, uh, John sir and uh, Sami sir, both of you. Thank you so much. And uh, for our attendees, we uh, have a feedback call. So please um, uh, give your feedback. Uh, it'll help us in, uh, you know, in our future uh, talks also. Uh, John sir, uh, you want to say something? Uh, I just would probably like to add for the point Sampada you had raised in the beginning in terms of the cost effectiveness. What someone has asked about cost effectiveness was generally about this and when it comes to gaming part as well. Uh, I think the cost effectiveness, if you buy one person buys one equipment for themselves, it is going to be expensive. But if that is a mechanism or a way where we could rent out uh, this device, I don't know. We don't have that mechanism, but uh, a person who could use it for one month and then rotate to our next patient or something like that. See, it's a cost about 25,000. If they already have a TV, just another additional 25,000 rupees. It is a big cost for many people. So maybe by convert uh, by using a uh, one item that can be rotated across many patients over time, maybe it might come down. But I think cost at at, at this point should not uh, stop us from considering other opportunities. That's what I wanted to say. So we need to find a mechanism how we can make it feasible for patients to uh, ask the identify. So with that, I will also like I would really like to thank SIP for giving this opportunity. It was great. Uh, is there any way that actually we, I would like to answer some of those questions, type and send. Is there any way that we can answer after the session is over? Is it possible to type and reply back or is it has to happen during the session? Yes, sir, we'll let you know the way. And also some people have asked for both of your um, email IDs. So probably- I have, have posted. Uh, I have put it up already in the chat. Yeah. Uh, so you know, you will be getting some questions through mail also. Okay, yeah, yes, I think I can respond to uh, the ones that come in May. And if possible, after the session, if it is still accessible, I would be, I will uh, reply to the question and suggestion. Yes, uh, and this talk is going to be, uh, you know, it is already recorded and it will be available on YouTube for future references of, you know, by the people. So, thank you so much. Thank you for being here and uh, presenting it in such an easy way and making it so very interesting. And um, I will also thank SIB for um, having all of us here on this platform. I think it was my personal delight also to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, John, thank sir. You. Sam, sir. You're welcome. Thank Bye. you, Sampada. Thank you. Nice meeting you. Nice. And thanks for all the participants for being here. Thank yeah, you. And thanks for the participants. They have been really good. Thank awesome. you.